is, is that we're essentially dealing with uh, the modern biota. And many of the animals that we see on the landscape today, in fact, all of the animals that we see on the landscape today, were running around the planet somewhere alongside mammoths and mastodons and saber-toothed cats. And so in, in many ways, I think the, the power of, of, of the work that I do and that my, that my colleagues do in studying the Ice Age is that we really can put a historical perspective on the, the modern biota. I think that's really the, the strength of, of Ice Age research. And I wanna show you tonight, I'm not gonna go into any, any of the, my, my specific research topics with any real great detail. Basically the intent of this talk is to give you kind of a broad overview of the work that we do here at the museum and where we go to find, and talk a bit about where we go to find Ice Age fossils in Alberta. A uh, little bit about my background. I always like to give people a bit of context about who I am and, and where I'm from. And you got a, a bit of my bio as part of the, the intro there. But for me, uh, I always like to talk a bit about how I got interested in the Ice Age. Um, I actually grew up in Western South Dakota in the Black Hills. Uh, if you've seen pictures of Mount Rushmore, I grew up about 45 minutes from, from Mount Rushmore. Uh, Mount Rushmore is, is interesting, but it's, it's compared to the, the beauty of the hills themselves, it, it's, it's fairly insignificant in my mind. Uh, it's a wonderful place to, to visit and a wonderful place if you're interested in, in nature and the outdoors. It's also a very interesting place paleontologically. And when I was an undergrad, uh, I went to a small liberal arts school in Spearfish, South Dakota. And I got a summer job working at a museum called the Mammoth Site of Hot Springs. And the slide here is a picture of the, the Mammoth Site. This is a, a, basically a museum. It's a dig site that they put a building around. And it's still an active dig site. You can still in the summertime go and see people digging up mammoth bones. But it was very influential in my career path. And, and it's a big part of the reason why I ended up studying the Ice Age. So the Ice Age and mammoths uh, have a, a very special place in my heart. All right, when I talk about the, the Quaternary or the Ice Age, we're essentially talking about the last 2.58 million years of geologic time. So geologically speaking, we're talking about, you know, very, very near time. The, the fossil record in Alberta is, is at least the vertebrate fossil record, is really broken into two time bins. It's the Quaternary, and then there are some Paleocene deposits, uh, certainly some lots of good Paleocene deposits in the Calgary area, but a lot of Alberta is covered by Cretaceous rock, and there's a big gap in the middle where we don't have a whole lot of a fossil record. My emphasis is really on this last 2.58 million years of geologic time, and that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And actually, much of the record here in Alberta is probably restricted to the last, oh, let's say 100 and 120,000 years or so. A lot of the earlier Ice Age record was probably obliterated by, by repeated glaciations across the province. The one exception to that uh, are some deposits down in the area near Medicine Hat, where we do get some, some older uh, vertebrate material. The Ice Age was a very dynamic time in Alberta, and I will probably throw out some, some terms tonight that, some abbreviations. Uh, I, I will probably use the term pre-LGM, and what I mean by that is roughly the time period 22,000 years ago and older. So 22,000 years ago to roughly 120,000 years ago. During that time frame, uh, much, of, much of the province would have been unglaciated. Certainly areas of Edmonton and Calgary would have been unglaciated. And then around 22,000 to 18,000 years ago, we move into the last glacial maximum, where basically all of Alberta, with few exceptions, is covered with ice. The Cypress Hills in southern Alberta might be an area that, was, that, that glaciers actually never went up over the top. Uh, but most of the province was, was covered in ice. And from my perspective, 
that makes Alberta a really, really interesting natural laboratory because there's not a much bigger ecosystem disturbance than putting ice across the, the province and wiping out life. So around 14,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, when Alberta starts to deglaciate, you've basically got a clean slate. And one of the things that I'm really interested in understanding over the long term is how life comes back to deglaciated landscapes. Ultimately, how do we go from nothing on the landscape to what you see when you walk out your front door or go on a, a nature hike today? That's, that's sort of the long-term goal of, of, for me and for the, the Quaternary Studies Program here at the, at the Royal Alberta Museum. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the modern biota that is, is essentially an ice age biota. Uh, they're, they're still rebounding of, of the rebounding effects taking place here in Alberta from from deglaciation. Uh, many of my colleagues here at the museum study aspects of, of you know, those populations rebounding from the impacts that the, the advance of glacial ice had on them. But ultimately, I like to reemphasize that when we study the ice age, we are studying the, the modern biota. And all of the little critters, the, the modern critters that you see here, were walking around the planet the same time that these extinct ice age critters were. And if you haven't, this is just a little plug for the museum. If you have not been to the museum, I would definitely invite you to, to come up sometime and, and check out the new museum in downtown Edmonton. Uh, the mural at the top here is, is now in our Ice Age gallery. And it's about, I think it's probably 10 feet by 30 or 40 feet. So it's a massive, massive mural, and it really sort of set, sets the stage for the Ice Age. Uh, the mural is actually intended to be a reconstruction of the Edmonton area uh, around 45,000 years ago. Okay, now I mentioned that I'm not gonna get too deep into specific scientific topics or specific research topics tonight. But I, I do want to point out that a lot of the work that we do here does tie back into hypotheses that I've been chasing for various, various parts of my career. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is understanding the role of elevation and how elevation may have allowed certain animals to persist over geologic time. Uh, that's a project that I started when I was doing work down in Nevada and I've continued to, to do that. Um, I'm also interested in understanding whether extinctions and uh, recolonizations are, are synchronous. Do they, do they sort of play out in the, in the same way? How, do, how does the extinction leading up to, to the, sorry, how do the local extinctions that occurred before the advance of glacial ice compare with recolonization in terms of their taxonomic composition. Um, I'm also interested in how animals respond to major ecosystem disturbance. So how does life come back to a deglaciated landscape? When that ice leaves, does everything just sort of pop their head up and say, oh, well, Alberta's open, let's all go back. Or do they come back in an individualistic way? How does that pattern play out? And I think that's actually, that, that, that is the, you know, that is probably the, the paper or the book that I'm going to write towards the, the end of my career. But I also think it's the, the piece that probably will have the, the most lasting impact because I, that's where Alberta is, is such a neat natural laboratory because we're uniquely placed to understand how animals respond to major, major ecosystem disturbance and how, how communities or how assemblages come back afterwards. And then finally, I'm, I'm interested in the last 12,000 years or so of geologic time. Uh, we sort of view that as a, as a time period where, okay, the ice left and everything sort of stabilized. Uh, but was that time period really stable? Have there been biogeographic shifts within that those last 12,000 years. So those are some of the types of questions that I'm chasing. And 
we chase those questions. A lot, a lot of the work we do involves field work. And so the, the map that I drew over here to the, to the right shows you the, the breadth of the localities that we have, we have visited across the province. You'll notice there's not nearly, uh, nearly enough up here in the, the far northern parts of Alberta. Uh, that's primarily due to the, the, the depth of the boreal forest there, but also because of the acidic soils. Acidic soils tend to be bad for bone. They tend to break down bone very quickly. So we just don't have the same type of record, at least not yet, from northern Alberta that we do from, from the southern two-thirds of the province. Um, I'm going to take you to several different spots tonight. Uh, I'm just going to put them all up here. Uh, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how we do the work we, we do, the different types of deposits that, that we work in, and just show you some of the fossils that we find from some of these different areas. So we're going to start out in the mountains, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work that I'm doing in caves in the mountains. And we're going to go to the Edmonton area and talk about work with the sand and gravel industry. Then we will move up to the Lac La Biche Cold Lake area and talk about some of the work that we're doing in, in lakes in, in those areas. Down to southern Alberta to talk about the Wally's Beach site at the St. Mary Reservoir. And then a few comments on material that comes out of the Calgary area. Okay. So let's go to the mountains. Uh, one of the great things about what I do is I get to go to some, some really cool places. Uh, this is, a, the, well, you probably can't see it real well, but the arrow is pointing to the entrance to a cave in Jasper National Park. One of the things that I, that I did when I moved to Alberta was I sent an email to the Alberta Speleological Society and I said, hey, this is who I am. I'm interested in bones that are coming out of caves. And uh, luckily, I got a, a call back from a now colleague at Jasper National Park and said, I've got a couple of sites to show you. And so my colleague, Greg Horn, has been showing me various cave sites and collecting samples for me from some of the caves in, in Jasper National Park for the last 12 or 13 years or so. So caves are a big part of what I do. And it's kind of ironic because I have to admit I am I'm fairly tall and I'm about as flexible as an icicle. So uh, I, I wouldn't consider myself, myself a caver in the, the sense that, that most cavers use that term, but I do quite a bit of work in caves. One of the first sites, actually the first site that, uh, that Greg took me to was a site called Disaster Point Cave. Uh, this is in Jasper National Park and uh, this is a, a cross-sectional map of the cave. So it's about 105 foot rappel to get into the cave. And when we went into this cave, I could immediately see bone sitting on the surface of the cave floor, which is always a good sign for a paleontologist. Uh, we ultimately ended up doing most of the work in the deepest known part of the cave down here called the terminal dig. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in just a second. Uh, this is us actually doing some sampling in the cave. So a lot of times when you see bones on the surface of cave floors, if you've got plastic sediments or un uncemented sediments there, uh, they're usually a good place to go and sample and then take those, those samples back and wash them through screens. And you will quite often find fossils of small mammals, uh, small snails, lizards, amphibians. And that, that proved to be the case with Disaster Point Cave. Uh, this was also, I'm gonna take a slight detour here uh, because I love this set of slides. Uh, and it was also really my first introduction as someone who moved up here from Texas. It was my first introduction to new field hazards and wildlife in Alberta. So unbeknownst to me, uh, the, the Parks Canada had a trail cam or a motion activated camera, a game cam set up to monitor the entrance of, of the cave. And I had no idea that these photos were taken until about I don't know, 
three, four weeks after we were at the site, Greg wrote to me and said, hey, take a look at the pictures that came from the game cam at, uh, at Disaster Point Cave. All right, so I'll have you take note of the timestamp. So 11-11, that's uh, my colleague Greg getting ready to go in. This is me hanging onto a tree for dear life. It had been a long time since I had done any vertical work where you're, you know, getting on ropes and rappelling. So I have to admit, I was, I was pretty nervous at this point. So I'm sure I was giving off all kinds of crazy scents, even through my gloves onto the tree. And you see the timestamp there. I actually probably dropped into the cave only about 20 minutes before this photo took place. And you'll see Mr. Bear is sniffing the spot where my sweaty, nervous hand had been, had been clinging to the tree. Uh, he's looking down into the entrance. The first bit of work we were doing was right below where we dropped in. I'm sure, I'm sure he could hear us. Have another sniff of the tree. Smile for the camera. And then that's me coming out of the, out of the cave several hours later. I will admit that I, I walked around and I checked our packs when I got out of the cave and I saw no evidence <laughs> that, that there had been a bear there. Um, I was so happy to be out of the cave at that point that I'm not sure what I would have done, if, you know, had I popped my head up and seen a black bear standing there. But anyways, that was my sort of first introduction to new field hazards here in Alberta. And when they sent me those photos, I probably spent two or three hours one afternoon just going back and forth between them. I thought it was fantastic, a great set of slides. My wife was not quite as enthusiastic about that set of photos as I was. Okay, so back to the cave itself. Uh, one of the, here's an example of the kind of things that I look for. This is a bone that's got a little bit of travertine, a little bit of calcite formed in the cave over the top of the bone. And that's usually a good sign of antiquity. The other thing that was really interesting at this particular cave site was when we got down to that deepest part of the cave, uh, there had been some disturbance because some, some folks had moved some sediments around to see if these sediments were just filling in another passageway. And by doing that, they actually exposed a nice cross-sectional face. And in that cave face, I could see little bits of bone I could see darkly banded layers that had charcoal and organic remains in them. Uh, from, a, from a paleontological perspective, this is the kind of thing that I'd love to see when I walk into a cave. So, because it means that we can go in and excavate through what appears to be a stratigraphic sequence and get some good data. Uh, we ended up taking a fairly small sample of the, of the profile that was exposed there. And we got set three radiocarbon ages ranging from about 6,000 years ago to about 1,700 years ago. So this is not the, the older stuff that I typically work on. But again, one of the things that I'm trying to understand is how life comes back to these deglaciated landscapes and how we ultimately get to where we're at today. So records that fall within the last 12,000 years are the thing that are, that, that are ultimately going to tell us that. Um, a wide variety of animals. This is a little shrew jaw all with the characteristic uh, red pigment in the, in the teeth. Uh, there were some mustelids. Uh, basically, each one of these little vials has a single specimen in it. And that's one of the really challenging things that, about working at some of these cave sites is you go in and you take a small sample, but you end up with hundreds of specimens. Getting those specimens cleaned up, put into individual vials, assign numbers. Uh, it all takes a pretty significant amount of time. And, and then you can actually finally sit down and start to do some science. Uh, another site that uh, we've done a bit of work in is also in Jasper National Park, a very different type of cave. Uh, this is a sub-zero cave. Temperatures tend to stay sub-zero uh, the, the whole year round. It's this is up above tree line. And it also represents one of the sites where we're getting some fairly old material. Now, this, this photo is me. One of the things that, that was amazing about this particular cave site is once you get into the entrance and into this first sort of main passage, this passage, this floor is filled with pack rat dung. So it's all pack rat poop. And 
pack rats are notorious collectors. They'll go out and collect plant remains, they'll collect bone remains, and when they're inhabiting caves, they quite often bring this stuff back. And in places like the arid southwest, they will, they'll urinate all over that, that assemblage of stuff and create what we call a pack rat midden. Uh, in places where it's really dry, that material will start to all caramelize together and can be preserved for 40, 50, 60,000 years. At this particular site, there was a bit of that sort of consolidated midden, but a lot of it was loose pack rat. And my original intent at this site was to put in a small excavation. The problem with digging through pack rat dung that's not cemented together though, is it acts kind of like marbles. Every time you take a scoop, more just seems to roll back in. So we, we ended up having to change our strategy at this site a little bit. And we didn't do necessarily a, a proper excavation, but we just sampled specific things through the passageway that looked like they might have some antiquity to them to try to get a sense of how old the site was and to get a sense of when life returns to really high elevations in Jasper National Park following deglaciation. Uh, these are a couple of pictures of some of the more consolidated pack rat midden material. So basically this is an assemblage of poop, plant material, urine, and probably, probably some water in there. Uh, there was bone spread throughout. The primary collector at, at this particular site is probably the bushy-tailed wood rat, Neotoma cenaria. Uh, all of these sites have contributed to a radiocarbon dating program. Uh, again, one of the things that I'm interested in, particularly at these sites, is understanding when life came back to deglaciated landscapes we, and we've got a great record of that for lower elevations, but there's not such a great record for high elevations. So this is, caves are one way that we can start to understand what was going on at higher elevations in Alberta right after deglaciation. And some of the radiocarbon dates that we're getting, you know, are, are, are telling us, I think, something about when mammal communities really became established at, at higher elevations. So. The oldest date that we've got so far is around 9,600 plus or minus 40 years BP. Those are, that's, that's in radiocarbon years. Um, and that's telling us something about when the ice receded or melted off and left the landscapes habitable, uh, allowed vegetation to come back and after the vegetation, the plants. Uh, one interesting thing about some of the work that we've been doing in these in, in these caves, I, I haven't gotten actually as many early dates as I was hoping to get from some of these sites. And so the, the, that in and of itself is kind of interesting. And I think the, the story that I started out to tell with this work that we're doing in, in some of these cave sites was really a biological story, understanding when life comes back. But I think what we're, the story that we're actually going to be able to tell, or that we're in the process of telling, I'm actually working on this, this manuscript right now, is that is more of a geological story. And I think what these, these radiocarbon dates are telling us is something more about the preservation uh, within cave sites and the geologic dynamics that have been going on in cave sites in the Canadian Rockies. I suspect that a lot of the material that, that may have been older and deposited in these caves was ultimately flushed by the masses of, of water uh, associated with melting, with melting glaciers. There's clearly some evidence of, of uh, high geolo geologic dynamism in some of these cave sites. And I think our radiocarbon record uh, seems to reinforce that idea and is consistent with that idea. Okay, let's move to, hang on one second, I just have to get a quick drink of water. Okay, let's move up to the Edmonton area and let's talk about a, a bit of the work that we do with the sand and gravel industry. Uh, I would say probably at least 40 to 50% of the Ice Age fossil record that we have in Alberta, we have because of the sand and gravel industry. The same deposits that produce really good sand and gravel for industry also produce Ice Age fossils. 
And I'm sure most of you have been to the Drumheller area or Dinosaur Provincial Park. You know, you walk around Dinosaur Provincial Park and you can't help but trip over dinosaur bone, it seems, almost everywhere you go. The Ice Age record in Alberta is not built that same way. We do have lots of fossils, but they tend to be thinly distributed among huge volumes of gravel. So it's, it's really in many ways like, like uh, finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, to give you some sense of the scale of these gravel deposits, the photo at the bottom here, over to the right, uh, the cursor is pointing to a small person standing there. And this is all sand and gravel that's being excavated from a gravel pit out west of Edmonton. So it gives you some sense of the scale of those deposits. Uh, these are not areas where I can go out and walk the surface and say, yep, there's probably a mammoth here. Really the only way that we're seeing a lot of the Ice Age fossils that we see in the province is because industry is actually taking heavy equipment and they're putting big blades in the ground. So we, work, we try to work pretty closely with industry uh, to recover Ice Age fossils that are exposed when they're, when they're excavating these deposits. A big part of the Ice Age collection at the, at the Royal Alberta Museum uh, started because of this fellow. Uh, this is a gentleman named Gene Seal. And Gene, back in the late 80s, early 90s, worked for a lot of different gravel companies uh, around the Edmonton area. And he's standing on the shaker deck of one of the, one of the crushers, and he's pulling clay balls off of there. So they don't, they would have guys standing up there to pull clay balls off so the crusher didn't get gummed up. Uh, Gene got tired of just picking clay balls and ended up starting to pull bones. He was seeing bones uh, moving down the, these conveyors and, and the, the shaker deck. And he started pulling those bones off. And Gene, I don't have a specific number, but I would guess contributed probably one, to, at least one to 2,000 specimens, maybe more to the collections here at the museum, uh, simply from standing on shaker decks and saving the bone, the Ice Age bones before they went into the crusher. So his contribution to the, you know, to Alberta's fossil record and our knowledge of the Ice Age in Alberta is, is really immeasurable. Uh, Tons of material, as I said, comes from these gravel, gravel pits. And uh, to give you an example of how rich some of these sites can be, uh, the clover bar sand and gravel pits in the Edmonton area, which is now, I believe, pretty much played out. Uh, this was probably four or five years ago. We got a call from, from them. They said, hey, we've been setting bones aside for you guys. And we went out and picked them up and there was over 200 specimens of mammoth bison in forest. So one of the ways that we try to work with industry is, you know, we, is I, I get education, through education. We do a lot of outreach with industry and really, you know, our, our intent is not to see these operations shut down. I mean, that, that would be, for, for me as a scientist, that would be counterproductive because the only reason that we're seeing these fossils is because industry is putting big blades in the ground. So what we do ask of industry is when they run across something, at least set it aside for us, don't let it go into the crusher and we'll come and pick it up. And this was a good example of that system playing out really, really well. Uh, I always like to run through a little bestiary. So we've talked a bit about you know, the, the significance of gravels in terms of what they're producing. Let's talk about some of the actual animals that, that those, those gravel deposits are telling us we're here in Alberta during the Ice Age. This is a big mammoth molar. That's a single, a single molar. Uh, this is a baby mammoth jaw, and then obviously woolly mammoths. We had two flavors of mammoths in Alberta. Woolly mammoths are the iconic one that everybody is most familiar with, stood around eight to 10 feet at the shoulder, had the big long shaggy coats. Uh, most of the, the mammoths that we find in Alberta are probably woolly mammoths. Another form of mammoth that we do find a, some evidence of by looking at the teeth are Colombian mammoths. And these are mammoths that were slightly larger, 12 to 14 feet at the shoulder, weighing about 20,000 pounds. And these guys occur primarily to the south. So 
in that sense, Alberta is kind of an interesting spot because you potentially have these two different populations of, of mammoths meeting at various times in Alberta. And there's a, there's a ton of work uh, going on right now to try to understand how these, how these animals were related. Some of you, if you follow any of the, the science websites, uh, there was a, there's a brand new paper out today that uh, looked at ancient DNA pulled from mammoths in Siberia. And that's actually shedding light on the relationship between Columbian mammoths and, and woolly mammoths. And that's actually one thing that's interesting about the record here in Alberta. A lot of the bone that we get is actually really well preserved and preserved to, the, to a degree that we can extract ancient DNA from it. So it's allowed us to do some really interesting research on different groups of animals here in the province. There were mastodons here. So mastodons for all intents and purposes look a, a lot like mammoths. They're a little bit shorter, a little bit stockier, and they have a very different tooth structure. So mammoths are, are were probably primarily grazers eating you know, several hundred pounds of, of grass a day. Mastodons were browsers eating a very different type of vegetation. They're quite often found in association with black spruce. And some of the work that actually some of the work that that I've collaborated on uh, uh, in terms of looking at ancient DNA from these animals and and looking at the mastodon record here in Alberta seems to suggest that mastodons were here primarily during the interglacial time. So they weren't. There may have been some overlap when mammoths and mastodons were 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 both here, but they were probably occupying different niches. And we lose mastodons much sooner than we lose mammoths in Alberta. This is one of my favorite Ice Age animals. This is a giant short-faced bear. These are bears that stood six feet high when they were down on all four legs. So very, very good sized bears, 10 to 12 feet high when they're on their hind two legs. They're more closely related to South American spectacled bears than they are brown bears or grizzly bears. But uh, a very, very impressive omnivore roaming Alberta's landscapes until about 11, 12,000 years ago. Uh, this, for my money, this specimen here at the bottom is one of the best specimens that we have in the collection. So when you think about how the Ice Age, some of these big Ice Age fossils are found, they're uncovered, well, first of all, they're deposited in a fairly high energy environment. So these, these gravels in the Edmonton area uh, represent fairly high energy systems. So they're deposited in a high energy environment. They're uncovered by heavy equipment. They're dumped onto a conveyor or a shaker deck. And in the case of this one, it was actually pulled off the shaker deck before it went into the crusher. And it's still got all of its, or almost all of its teeth intact, which is amazing. So this is a lower jaw of the American lion which is the size equivalent to African lions that were roaming around Alberta until around 11,000 years ago. Bison are a pretty important component of the, the landscape. Uh, I'm gonna take a slight, a, a slight deviation here and tell you a little story about this bison skull at the bottom because it kind of highlights how we, how we work with folks who bring fossils to our attention. So this is a, this skull was brought to my attention uh, through a phone call that was passed to me by a colleague here at the museum. Uh, a, a woman who lived out at Sherwood Park, who was a teacher, uh, called about a skull that her, her husband had found while working in a gravel pit out near Sherwood Park. And, he brought this thing home and she was really excited to know more about it. Unfortunately, she made the mistake of, of looking online and seeing what online had to say about finding fossils in Alberta. And the first thing that she ran across was that, you know, you'll be fined $50,000 and, you know, there's potential jail time and da, 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 da. And while those, while those, there are regulations in place, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's the regulations being in place and then how we work within the, the framework. Fossils in Alberta are, are considered crown property. So any fossils that you find in, in Alberta 
are property of the crown unless you get special dispensation from the the ministry. Um, at, at the time, it was the the Ministry of Culture. Our our, our ministry name has changed since. Then. So, anyways, the the point being that that this gal was very concerned that she was going to be in trouble and was nervous about bringing this to my attention. I said, look, I'm interested in the scientific side of it. How about I come out and have a look at it? You don't even have to tell me where it's from. And so I went out to visit her, walked into her backyard, and this skull is sitting in her backyard along with a big chunk of a mammal tusk. So I was pretty excited about it. And she was very excited about it. So I said, hey, why don't you hang on to the skull. You're obviously enthusiastic about it. Hang on to it. But at some point, when you've shown everybody your bison skull, and you're tired of dusting it, and nobody wants to see it again, that will be a good time for it to, to come to the museum. I think, you know, I feel very strongly as somebody who works at a museum, one of the things that, that you know, our intent should be is to get people excited about science and about the work that we do. And I know I got started in paleontology because I went out as a little kid when I was eight years old with my uncle and started collecting Cretaceous ammonite. So there is something to, you know, holding that ancient fossil in your hands and it, it's just something that, that connects with people. So uh, she ended up hanging on to the skull for a couple of years. And then after a couple of years, we stayed in touch. She said, you know, I'm ready for Buck to come to the museum. So she named it Buck. And Buck is now actually on display in the, in the gallery. But it's a great example of how we work with folks who bring bones and fossils to, to our attention. Um, our, you know, we're not, there's a, there seems to be a lot of paranoia that if people bring stuff to our attention at the museum that it's going to be taken away from them. And I just, I feel that that's, that's, that would be kind of counterproductive. So, Eventually, yes, there are things that, you know, that really should end up at the museum. And this was an example of that. And it ended up coming to the museum. So, sorry, that's just a bit of an aside, but it's kind of an important part of, of what we do here at the museum. So I like to, I like to chat about that. Uh, we had giant ground sloths in Alberta. Uh, so this is, this is the, the big megalonics that we had in Alberta. So again, eight to 10 feet at the shoulder, really, really weird bones. And these guys are very rare. I would say we, I think we have maybe five, only five or six uh, specimens from any type of ground sloth, uh, certainly from, from most of Alberta, excluding maybe the medicine hat area. There may be a bit more material that was collected there that is at the Royal Ontario Museum. We had two different flavors of musk oxen in Alberta. This is a, a partial skull of a helmeted musk oxen. And then we also have evidence of the tundra musk ox, uh, which, which lives up in the NWT and maybe gets into parts of, of Northern Alberta today. But we found musk oxen as far, as far south as Medicine Hat in the ice age. Horses are a big component of the record. Camels, the camels are native to North America. Camels evolved in, in North America and then dispersed elsewhere. So camels are a, a big component of what we find in the Ice Age record in Alberta. Elk arrived uh, later. Uh, elk, the, the oldest record that we have of elk in Alberta is around 9,900 years, years old. Uh, so elk and moose are both sort of late arrivers. They were certainly kicking around the planet that when, the, when these other animals were here, but they arrived fairly late. Uh, and then we do have some other sort of charismatic carnivores. Homotherium, the dirt tooth cat, has been found at the Wally's Beach site down in southern Alberta. So uh, again, just this is just intended to, to give you some flavor of what Alberta looked like in terms of its big mammals during the during the ice age. So what do we do with all those bones? Uh, one of the challenges to working in the Alberta record is we don't have deposits like the like Dinosaur Provincial Park where you go out and you might excavate uh, from a stratigraphic unit or from a geologic unit that represents a, you know, a, a whole community preserved. 
we tend to get bits and pieces. So one of the challenges in working with the Ice Age record in Alberta is we have a single specimen from this site and another specimen from this site. And we don't know how they relate to one another age-wise. So we, we tend to do a lot of direct radiocarbon dating on these bones. But if you start to piece all of those individual records together, you can start to do some interesting science and ask some interesting questions. And one of the projects that I worked on shortly after I moved here was looking at pre-LGM deposits. So those deposits that, that predate the advance of glacial ice and comparing them with post-LGM dates. So those, everything that came after the, the ice lap. And one of the things that we see when we look at the relative abundance of different large mammals is a, a, very, a very distinct change as we move from pre-LGM time into post-LGM time. And that big difference is that Alberta was probably a horse-dominated landscape before the last ice age. The record is, is thick with, with horse remains. The post-LGM record, horses come back, mammoths come back, but bison really take off. So I think that's, that's, that's one area that the Alberta record has, has really contributed in a unique way. Um, we, we tend to think of bison as this iconic animal, and it is an iconic animal that characterized Western landscapes, but it really only characterized Western landscapes for the, a fairly recent uh, period of time, from roughly 12,000 years ago, it uh, it it that that change was something fundamental that shifted. We don't have a good explanation for why that shift happened and why we lose animals like horses. Uh, for me, that's still one of the the confounding uh, losses that that we had in North America was the the loss of the horse populations at, at, at a local level in North America. Um, it happens, but we don't have a great explanation for it at this time. Another thing that we've been able to take those bits and pieces and use them to, to tweak out is the, the timing that some of these different animals were here. So I mentioned that we have to do a lot of direct radiocarbon dating. Everything that we've dated, every mastodon that we've dated tends to come back at least 40,000 years old. Whereas mammoths, mammoths occur in the, some of the deposits the same age, but they persist. So again, this sort of ties back into the, the, some of the work that I alluded to earlier that we're starting to tweak out some patterns and understand when some of these animals were here. And one of the things that I'm starting to pursue for my next little project is to actually look at the distribution of mammoths through time. Because I'd like to understand if that distribution is really continuous or if there are periods where we see greater hiatus in the distribution of mammoths in, in Alberta. So there's a lot left to, to explore with some of these, with some of these fossils. Okay, so that's the, the Ice Age record from gravel deposits. Let's talk about a slightly more recent record that we've been working on uh, in a different part of the province in a very different way. So I talked a bit about working in caves. I talked a bit about uh, working with uh, gravel deposits. Another area that is opening some new doors for us is actually looking at lake deposits. And part of the reason I got interested in lakes was, let's see, I think I have a picture of it, was because of this guy right here. Uh, Red is a gentleman that lives in Cold Lake and he's a scuba diver. And he, uh, he excavated, or not excavated, he was diving one day in Cold Lake and pulled this bison skull up from the bottom of the lake. Brought me pictures to the museum and I, Looking at the size and shape of the horn cores, I thought, you yeah, know, this, this could have some antiquity to it. We ended up getting a date on it. It's over 10,000 years old. Now, the interesting thing about, about that is it comes from the Cold Lake area, which is in the southern part of the boreal forest. You're starting to get into the boreal forest. 
So I mentioned that there's not a lot of great records uh, from the boreal forest. This is a way that I think we might be able to start to change that. Uh, so we've, we've started a program. I'm not a diver. I'm not a, I, I'm, in fact, I'm not a, I'm not a swimmer. I'm not afraid of the water. So I'll, I'll work in shallow areas, but I'm, I'm not going to go into the, the deep areas. But those shallow areas are starting to produce some interesting records for us. So one of the spots that I've been working in is around Lac La Viche in Beaver Lake and another lake called North Buck Lake, which is out to the west of, of Lac La Viche. Uh, a colleague from forestry actually uh, is the one that sort of instigated my coming up and looking at these lakes and we found a ton of bone along these shallow shorelines. Uh, you would think that, oh, this is probably just recent stuff. Well, we've gotten dates as old as four or 5,000 years old on some of these bones. And one of the interesting things about it is I think it's actually starting to tell us something about, uh, again, not only the biota and the, the biota that's there, but also a geologic story. Because I think some of these deposits are, are suggestive, or some of these records are indicating that these lake levels were lower during the, the mid Holocene. Um, let's see, I, I love to show this photo. This is, a, this is from North Buck Lake and this is a bison skull that has basically been thin sectioned by wave action moving back and forth. So it's basically cut away and you're kind of looking into the, the brain cavity there of the, of the bison skull. We didn't collect this one because it was because it was quite fragile, but we collected a lot of other material from this site. And uh, these are records that, that I have to be honest, it, it, 20 years ago, if I was walking past a, a record that I thought was a three or 4,000 year old bison, I probably would not have stopped and picked it up. But the world has changed. There are a lot of new, uh, amazing analytical techniques one of the most significant being the ability to extract ancient DNA from these bones. So I think the, this material that we're collecting that's four or 5,000 years old is ultimately going to allow us to understand in a much more meaningful way how we went from nothing on the landscape to how we got here today. Uh, and these are the records that are going to supply samples for ancient DNA analysis. For people who might be interested in understanding what was happening with bison as we rolled up into the 1800s and they nearly became extinct in North America. Th these records may provide samples that will shed light on the genetics of what was happening during that time. So I think there's a, there's a lot of power uh, that is yet to be realized by collecting some of these more recent records. And it's allowing us to get up into the boreal forest, which I think is exciting. Uh, these are just a few more things that were recovered from one of the lake sites. This is actually from, these are all from Cold Lake. That's the bison skull that Red found. This is a partial muskrat skull, uh, part of a bison humerus, and then an otter skull. So a real diversity of animals are coming out of, of these deposits too, which is kind of exciting, including some small mammals. Okay, uh, let's go to Southern Alberta. This is the, the Wally's Beach uh, at the St. Mary Reservoir. Uh, this is an area where we're doing active field work. We typically only get out there in the early spring or the early or the late fall uh, because water levels come up in the summertime and most of the deposits that have Ice Age fossils in them are, uh, are covered by water for a good portion of the summer. Uh, you guys are all from Calgary. I would suspect that many of you are familiar with Dr. Len Hills, who passed away just a few years ago. Len was pretty instrumental, along with Brian Coyman at the University of Calgary, at doing a lot of the original work at Wally's Beach. And this site is so significant because it has amazing uh, Ice Age vertebrate remains. It's got bones. It's got tracks. So this is a series of mammoth tracks at the Wally's Beach site. And because the wind blows quite often in Southern Alberta and kicks up, this material, these, these tracks and 
bones that have been deposited at the site continue to be exposed. It's also a significant site because of, well, I'm gonna go here, because there's an archeological component to it. So this is a, a site that, you know, that crosses disciplinary boundaries. Uh, we've got archeologists working at this site. We've got paleontologists working at this site. And it is probably one of the most significant sites that we have in Alberta in, in terms of the Ice Age. Uh, it dates to, a lot of the material that we're getting from the site dates to around 11, 12,000 years ago. So right before we lose horses to extinction in North America, right before we lose mammoths to extinction in North America. So this site really represents sort of the last gasp of Ice Age megafauna in Alberta. And we're in the process of laying out the, this material and getting ready to describe everything that's been recovered. Some of it's already been, been worked on, but there's a, a lot to be done on this site. And I think there's a lot yet to be revealed about, about why we lose some of the big Ice Age animals that we lose. And this site is going to be extremely informative with respect. Uh, this is just a reconstruction of what we think the, the Wally's Beach area uh, looked like roughly 10, 11,000 years ago. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to go visit. Okay, and then the last area that I'm going to take you is back to your, your, your home city there, Calgary. Uh, I've done a little bit of, of work in Calgary, uh, not, not a ton. Uh, there are several of my colleagues from the University of Calgary, you know, already had research programs down there. So there hasn't, there hasn't been a, a ton of work that, that the museum has done in the Calgary area, but we've done a bit more over the last, over the last few years. Uh, this is a colleague of mine, Bob Da, pointing to a piece of bison bone in Fish Creek Provincial Park. Uh, so there, the creeks and, and, and rivers in the Calgary area are a really significant source of Ice Age vertebrate material. And we're, we're continuing to sort of monitor those sites and evaluate those sites for, for Ice Age finds. <clears throat> Just some more bone from, from Fish Creek. Uh, so when you're out doing your nature hike, part of the reason that I, that I throw these slides in because I, I, I know groups like yours are out on the landscape a lot. And you guys, there's probably four or five of us who do this kind of Ice Age paleontology in, in all of Alberta. And it's a big province. So for us, it's really important that we have people who are looking out for things uh, for us. So when you're out hiking, if you, you know, see something sticking out of a gravel bar, it could be an Ice Age fossil. One of the challenging things about working with the Ice Age fossils is a lot of times they do, they, they don't look much different than, than modern bones. So the context is really important. You know, if you find a bone sitting in a farmer's field, yeah, it's probably an old cow bone. But if you see a bone that looks like a modern bone sticking out of the side of a riverbank and it's eight feet down, it's probably an Ice Age bison. Um, so I would ask that, you know, this group, especially when you're out on the landscape, if you're seeing bones, if you're seeing things, give us a shout, take a picture, uh, record a GPS coordinate and give us a shout. A lot of the work that we're actually doing right now, we're doing because people brought fossil material to our attention and we came out and looked at it. So uh, I just th throw that out there for you. Uh, and then I wanted to throw this one in. This was a recent addition to the collection. This came from a construction project in downtown Calgary. This is a bison skull that's just over 11,000 radiocarbon years old. And I meant to go write the specific locality down before I gave this talk tonight, and I forgot to do that. But I want to say that it's, that it's pretty close to, to the Nose Hill area of Calgary. And it was on a, uh, I think it was a gas station that was being built. And this was recovered by one of the consultants that was, that was actually working on the project. So, okay. Uh, tonight's talk was really intended to just give you some flavor for the, the work that we do at the museum, where we do the field work and what kind of things that, 
that we will we look at. If you're really really interested in in this stuff or more of the meaty science that that we do, I've got tons of PDFs that are really really good bedtime reading that I can send to you. But uh, I'll leave you with this sort of parting thought that you know each site that we that we work at each little record that we go and collect contributes something unique to our understanding of the natural history of the province. And whether it does it in an immediate fashion or whether it does it in the sense that there's gonna be something there for some future generation that's asking a different type of question, it, it is contributing in a, in a meaningful way. The questions and the things that we work on will continue to evolve as we explore new sites and ultimately, one of the goals that I, that, I, that I hope we get to in a, in a really meaningful way at some point is that we can use these historical records to understand how animals have responded to major ecosystem disturbance. And we can use that to make better decisions about long-term conservation in the future. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, I always have to say thanks to folks for for funding and support, but also, especially to my collaborators. A lot of the, a lot of the collaborators, donors, you know, other stakeholders, none of the work that we do, none, none of what I presented is something that I do by my, myself. There's a, a huge team of, of people from the museum and from other institutions and from the public who have contributed to the work that we do here at the museum, uh, preserving, Alberta's heritage for future generations. So uh, there's too many to list, so I will just generally tip my hat to, to all those folks. And with that, I will be glad to take questions if you guys have them. Oh, it's great, great talk there, uh, Dr. Jass. If, um, so if anybody Please has any- Call me Chris, call me Chris. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Chris, yeah, anybody who has any questions, you can type them into the, the chat box. And then I can relay them, or uh, perhaps uh, Chris can see them on, on his screen on, on the chat box. I guess one question I have, like it's always is a question, is what's the latest thought in terms of the extinction of all these uh, Ice Age mammals? What's the sort of tilting one way or the other? Well, it's funny, it's funny you mentioned that because there was just a, a new study that came out a couple of days ago that points to climate change again as the big fact. Um, the reality, I think, is much more complex than that. I, I don't think there is a, a smoking gun that explains the extinction of Ice Age animals. Um, the, the, the two big hypotheses that have, been, have, have really been pursued for probably the last 40 to 50 years are the overkill versus the overchill hypothesis. So it's humans arriving in North America and wiping out a lot of the megafauna versus the rapid environmental change that we know that was occurring at the end of the last, last ice age. In reality, both probably contributed at different levels depending on which individual animals that we're talking about. And by that, I, I'll give you an example. So, so let's, let's talk about mammoths. If mammoths reproduced like elephants reproduced, they would 